At Intuit, we believe you cannot have prosperity without equality. Women and people of color should not be paid less than men for the same work. Three years ago, we made a commitment to reach and maintain pay equity for our employees. But pay equity is an ongoing process and all companies must join this fight. Like the 19th Amendment, we are not done. Hi, Carrie, and we're so glad you could join us today. Thanks so much. Hi, Jessica. My pleasure. It's an honor. So yeah, I just, for anyone who doesn't know you, I want to introduce Carrie Chandler, who is the Chief Human Resources Officer of Endeavor. And Endeavor kind of owns many things, most notably the world's largest talent agency, WME, as well as you know, ultimate fighting championships and professional bull riding and a host of other events and very cool things. And we're really happy to have you here. I, you know, there's been a lot going on for Endeavor this past year. So I think let's just maybe, let's start there. <laughs> let's start with like, okay, it's been a tough year, right? There was the IPO that had to get pulled. And then right after that, COVID hit. You had to stop production on a lot of events. You had to force you to have furloughs and layoffs. You know, looking back at all of this the past few months, maybe can you talk a little bit about, you know, how have you, what has been the biggest challenge from your perspective and kind of how have you been, have you addressed it? Yeah, sure. No, I, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to even address it. You, you mentioned the IPO. That was actually last year, believe it or not. It oh, feels, right. <laughs> it, I know. It's all kind of merged together, right? I'd say by far the biggest challenge um, this year has been, uh, you know, what's happened as a result of COVID, the business impact, the revenue impact, and um, our having to really shift modes very, very quickly to go into cost savings mode and to do it in a way that was still future focused. And what I mean by that is um, being able to institute some pretty immediate cost savings um, initiatives, but at the same time, knowing that this is not a situation that's gonna last forever. It may look very differently in the future, but we had to do it in a way where once business started coming back, we would be in a position to, to pivot without having to, uh, to stall too much. So it's, it's been very challenging in that way. Can you talk a little bit more about how you do that? Like, how do you make those cost cutting decisions like, with this idea of like, okay, we may have to ramp back up really quickly and get back to work. I mean, we, don't, we don't know the timing of this. It's interesting. You use a variety of tools and, and candidly, some of these tools were new for us and new for me as an HR executive. So, you know, you immediately, of course, think of layoffs. Um, but in addition to that, I'll, the reason a lot of HR professionals and businesses implemented furloughs, because with furloughs, the idea is you, uh, you maintain benefits for the employees and you try to keep them on such that if you have to turn that water faucet back on, with a fairly short time frame, you can do that and bring those individuals back. And another tool that we used that uh, actually worked quite well, and we used it around the globe, we put um, quite a few employees on a part-time arrangement and different types of part-time arrangements. So we reduced their hours and reduced their pay, but again, kept them on, kept them on with benefits, et cetera. So those are some of the tools that we used. And, um, you know, it, it was definitely a challenge because we had to implement these things in a time frame that in many respects was unprecedented. And we had to do it from you know, this environment that you and I are using today, this remote, uh, this remote environment. So super challenging. How did you, I mean, that's a really good point. And we've heard a lot of these like horror stories about, you know, all staff meeting over Zoom and you're all laid off. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you went about doing that in this remote world? Sure. I mean, it's an area that I have a huge passion about because, you know, I always say that in HR, we have the opportunity to kind of steer the ship and to figure out how you can implement something that has such negative consequences, uh, but with as much compassion as possible. So that was the thing that we tried to really emphasize across the globe. 
we made sure that every employee had an individual meeting, an individual video meeting, if that's what the employee preferred. Um, sometimes when an employee knows that, you know, some news of this sort is coming, he or she may not want to be on video. So we gave them that choice, but we always offered every single meeting had one of their immediate managers involved as well as an HR person um, so that they had that immediate support to know what types of, um, you know, severance we can offer, what types of um, continuing um, uh, benefits and things like that could be offered. So, and we did training. We did training for every single individual who would be involved in a meeting. And that in, uh, entailed having, um, you know, sessions all around the globe at all kinds of odd hours for us here in the U.S., but making sure, again, that every single person that was going to be involved in any individual conversation, um, you know, was trained in, in terms of how to conduct the conversations, what to expect, and most importantly, this, this theme of, you know, delivering the messages with as much compassion as possible. Can you talk a bit about where you are now with the people who've been furloughed and put part-time? Have you been able to bring any of those back full-time? Yes, we have. And, and, you know, the philosophy is to link it directly to the business, right? So as the business um, starts to return gradually, then we begin to bring people back gradually. So I think you're aware, for example, that um, we were fortunate enough to have a deal with the WNBA. They're playing down at IMG Academy down in Bradenton. So that's a good example of as we got that deal rolling, we started slowly but surely bringing back employees to help implement that. And not just employees at the academy, but if you think about the support functions like human resources and community communications and finance, et cetera. So that's the philosophy that we used and, um, and it's been working. So we've, we've definitely been able to, 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 to do some of that. Can you attach any numbers to that? <laughs> numbers of employees that we brought back? Um, you know, in, in the hundreds, in the hundreds. So. <laughs> okay. That's right. I mean, the other thing, and you and I have talked about this, was this idea of like, okay, there's band-aids you have to put in place because we're in this crazy crisis, but then there's permanent change. And can you talk a bit about what kinds of things you've put in place that you think will or hope will live on past COVID? You know, I think the biggest one when you really think about it, well, there's two. One is uh, there are a lot of people, employees, leaders, et cetera, who I don't think ever could have fathomed that you could pivot to a remote work environment so quickly and actually get massive things done in that environment. And so, you know, you have organizations that were very open to flexible work options before and some that were not so open to flexible work options. And my experience tells me that those that were not open to flexible work options it was because they didn't feel like it was really possible to get the same kind of work done. So I think that there's um, sort of proof in the pudding now that you can get a lot done in this environment. I think at the same time, though, I'm personally a, a believer in the hybrid approach, if you will, because I, I believe in human connection. I believe particularly in creative environments and innovative environments, you having people, you know, in, in, in a, actual physical environment can really increase innovation. And so I don't envision a world, and I don't know if we envision a world that will go 100% back to what it was like, but perhaps some sort of a hybrid approach and perhaps, you know, leaders who were hesitant before to see what work could be accomplished in this kind of environment will be more open to it. So, you know, those are the sorts of things I think about. And then from a business perspective, I think it's just rethinking you know, especially we have a big events business. And so, you know, how can you, how can you do different sorts of events? I was, um, our IMG media business was having a, a global town hall this morning. And I saw one of the questions that came in and it was about, you know, will we be contemplating drive-in events? You know, I mean, who would have envisioned that that question, <laughs> I mean, that question wouldn't have been on any town hall a year from now, I mean, a year ago, right? And so it's literally watching the business rethink every single thing that they're doing. We've got New York Fashion Week coming up in September and, you know, really excited that we're going to be able to move forward with that. But that's going to look very different, right? You know, so there will be more outdoor events. There will be events with far limited, you know, participation and people will be watching more online and things like that. So I think it's kind of reinventing how we think about work and how we think about business and delivering, um, you know, events and entertainment across the globe. That's really interesting. Are you thinking about driving events? 
I didn't see the answer to the question. <laughs> it was funny. Our leaders sent me a few of the things. They were like, hey, what do you think about this answer? And I saw that on there. But my guess is, you know, the imagination is a wonderful thing, right? And so my guess is the answer is absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, obviously another big theme that has come up and become more pressing is the need for more diversity across the board. Uh, and Endeavor has been pretty specific about things that they are trying to do with the, in this regard. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you're doing specifically to kind of make sure there's more employees of color, both at the company as well as in leadership positions? Sure. And it's, this is, and has been, you know, a very, I'd say, complicated issue for businesses for a very, very long time, as we all know. Um, what we're doing specifically is really elevating a DNI, a diversity and inclusion strategy that we had been working on right prior to COVID. Uh, we brought on board a woman named Allison Reedy Williamson on my team uh, last year to be our first uh, chief inclusion officer. And so she and I have been working really closely together to pull together this strategy. And um, COVID hit, you know, we went into the cost cutting mode that I talked about and, you know, other, I won't say other priorities, but we, we really had to dig in deep on the cost cutting. But it, it, with the tragic situation with George Floyd, et cetera, it gave us the opportunity to elevate that strategy that we were about to implement anyway. There's four uh, pillars of the strategy, which are employee engagement leadership, strategic partnerships, and, uh, and recruitment. And so we're looking at actions under each of those four different pillars. And there are some of the things that you have heard about um, companies doing for years, candidly, um, and the leadership area, holding leaders accountable. How do you tie results to, to, to bonuses, for example? We're looking at how do we actually set our own targets? You know, here's where we are and where do we want to be? So all of that work is happening right now. We're doing lots of really cool partnerships. Um, you may have read about the partnership we did with the Hashtag Change Hollywood initiative with Michael B. Jordan. So that gave us an opportunity to, again, elevate some of the things that we've been doing. What I have been particularly passionate about and um, maybe even a little preachy about, to be perfectly honest, is this concept of individual learning, particularly from our leaders, because everyone's asking the question about what's going to be different this time. And I think what really has to be different this time uh, is this concept of what can I do as an individual, as an individual leader? How can I, as I call it, not look the other way when it feels like something's not directly impacting me, but say, I've got a platform as a leader. How diverse is my team? Am I asking the right questions, you know, about the interview slates that I get <clears throat> and candidate slates? Am I... Um, Am I broadening my, my network, you know, broad, broadly enough in terms of where I'm looking for candidates or is it just the same people that I've always known kind of thing? And so we're really pressing hard with our leaders to lean into this concept of anti-racism so that they can see how you've got to be really proactive about these things. It's not just enough to sort of sit back and say, you know, things are things are good. No, they're not good. You've got to lean in and really, really make it happen. And and for us, I will tell you, Jessica, in this cost cutting environment, you know, retention is an issue for all companies. And so we've got to figure out not just how we recruit people, but how we really focus on those that we have and make sure that we can retain those individuals um, beyond, you know, what a compensation package might look like. And so those are, you know, those are some of the things that we've been talking about and, and doing. Are, I mean, you mentioned targets for your leaders. I mean, are you tying their compensation to hiring and retaining a diverse workforce? Yes, we're making a commitment that that's exactly what we're going to do. So this is going to be new for us, you know, as it is for, for many companies. And so once we have those targets set, we will definitely have a linkage to compensation. I mean, I think, you know, one thing I'm wondering about is just Hollywood in general. There's this challenge where it's Hollywood has not been very good at this. They've not been very good at elevating people of color. And they are very, it is an insular environment where they go to the same people and it's all their own network. I mean, why do you think that continues to be the case? And like, how do you see changing it? Again, I'm going to go right back to what I just talked about. I think, you know, I think when we talk about it as an industry, that there's safety in that for individuals, because, you know, we can all sort of 
I hate to use the word, but sort of hide behind the industry or even hide within our own company. It's about sort of facing the music as individuals and realizing, first of all, there's a serious business impact to not having diverse organizations. There's a serious business impact that you are limiting innovation and creativity. There is no doubt about it when you just have similar thinking at the table. And so, you know, I'm not sure that Hollywood is any worse off than a lot of different industries, candidly. You know, I said to some of our leaders when when we were doing this uh, work and, and really talking about our strategy, you know, who's the gold standard? Right. You know, there are very few people who can answer that question. There's a gold standard out there right now in terms of really, really leading in this area. I think there are tons of companies doing great work. A lot of the programs that we are all talking about, I've said these are the same programs we were talking about in the 80s. The difference has to be this individual motivation to act and to make a difference as an individual. And if enough people do that collectively, that's where I think the change comes. Do you, how do you keep it? I I mean, I guess it goes back to the compensation and like making sure it's part of the business metrics, right? Because I think there's a lot of skepticism out there that we're in this moment that like, and it's to your point, like there's this cost cutting going on, not just, you know, at your company, but all over the place. Like, how do you manage those two? I mean, they're in some ways opposing forces. Well, you know, for me, I've always thought that compensation is a short-term motivator for people. And, and when people challenge me on that, I ask them to think about the last big raise they got or even big bonus they got. And then I ask them, how long were they happy about it? How long were they even thinking about it? After two weeks, you're like done, right? <laughs> you're like, you're not celebrating that for, you know, months and years. You know, it is something that makes you feel really, really good in the moment. But what keeps you at a company and keeps you motivated you feel that you are directly tied to a line of sight at a business, meaning you know how what you're doing every day is contributing to the success of that business. And more importantly, I think you have some sort of passion and personal connectivity to what is being, you know, what that business is working on. And you have to feel included. And that's why, you know, that's the eye of the diversity and inclusion. Like, okay, you know, one of my friends, she always talks about diversity is um, being invited to the dance and inclusion is being um, actually asked to dance once you get there. And I, and I take it one step further and say, maybe it's actually being able to select the music, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's that, that being fully present and being able to fully contribute for the job that people have hired you to do, that's what really keeps people there. That's what keeps people there during the, during the tough moments like this year, knowing that this too shall pass. Um, you've gotta be able to think beyond, beyond the compensation. And don't, don't get me wrong, compensation matters in this concept of, you know, from a diversity standpoint, linking senior leaders' compensation to results, just like you would anything else. I'm a believer in that. But I also believe you got to go beyond that to really, to really make a difference. That makes sense. Um, I do want to ask you about, you know, you were at Under Armour before you were at Endeavor. (laughs) There have been reports about practices that were not particularly friendly to women, you know, expensing trips to strip clubs, women being chosen based on their attractiveness. Um, You know, HR is usually not listened to. And I'm curious as to like, how did you address this issue? You know, how did you get people's attention to it? So, you know, this one's always a little tricky for me because as a HR executive, I always want to keep it strictly professional. And, you know, obviously I can't start talking about specific situations, but I will say this. I will say that I am extraordinarily proud of the work that my team and I did to bring a lot of different issues at Under Armour to the surface and to be able to be part of the solution in addressing those things. Um, And, you know, I was at Under Armour for four years and it was a challenging time, not just personally, but it was a challenging time for the business. And I think um, as different business things are happening from a business perspective, you could also see the culture starting to change. And, And I think that that's really, really important. I think that companies like to hold on to um, the culture that got them to a certain place of success. 
But what they're not as good uh, doing is saying, okay, what aspects of that culture should we shed? Because that was then and this is now. And what aspects of that culture do we hold on to? Because it's really truly part of not just who we are, but who we want to be. And in order to do that, I think recognizing the value of HR as early as possible in a company's you know, sort of life cycle and bringing those experts to the table deep expertise to be part of decisions and things like that is extraordinarily important. So that's more of a broad statement, you know, kind of linking to your more specific question that I have a lot of passion about. Do you think, I mean, why is it that still, I mean, I think today still, like so many companies don't take HR seriously unless there's a crisis. Well, you know, I'll put a little bit of that on HR candidly. We have to demand it. We have to demand it. We have to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I hate to use the term in 2020 of earning your seat at the table because, I mean, you know, geez, if you haven't as a function by now, then, you know, we could talk about three hours about that, Jessica. But I do think that we have to demand and we have to make decisions for ourselves in terms of, you know, what do we believe is right and the role that we want to play. I mean, I, I have my my vision in terms of working as an HR executive, I want the function to always be seen as a really strong internal resource, not just for leaders, but for every employee at that company, where people feel like they can bring forth issues, concerns, and not just even issues and concerns, but just come to get advice and things about their career. Or, you know, I want to talk to my leader about this, and, and I don't really know how to approach him or her. I want us to always be that vehicle for the company. But also to your point, you know, respect it as a area of expertise. Our job is to help you see around corners, you know, the things you may not be able to see as a business leader. And we have to demand it. And, um, you know, we get to, we get to choose, we get to choose a bit, don't we, in terms of, you know, where we work and and where, (laughs) and where we, you know, contribute these things. So. No, I think that's a great point. Great. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for being with us today. I do want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So I'm going to open it up now to questions from our audience. Fantastic. Thanks, Jessica. Carrie, that was great. Thank you so much uh, again for coming. We have lots of questions to hit on, so I just want to make sure we get to everything. Um, one thing we should, you know, some people have asked about is about your DNI goals for 2020, 2021. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the agenda you've set on that front. Sure. Um, so thanks again, and it's um, it's it's actually work in progress. So. Our goals will fall within those four buckets that I talked about, leadership, engagement and retention, recruitment, and strategic partnerships. And we'll have both qualitative goals and quantitative goals. We are in the process of shaping those right now. We want them to be aggressive yet realistic in all areas. And we wanna make sure that they, in many instances, are gonna be business unit specific. We have various parts of our business, as you know, and rather than having sort of blanket one size fits all, we want to go deep into each of our businesses and set goals that will help them move the needle um, for their specific areas based on where they are today. Um, Can you talk a little bit about, a lot of people agree with this idea that compensation is a short term motivator. Can you talk about how else you're going to kind of get that buy in and that accountability? Sure. You know, I talked a little bit when we were talking earlier about this sort of personal responsibility. And I, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough. I really believe that that's going to be the differentiator. I believe that no matter what kind of goals an organization sets, because think about it as a country and certainly, um, historically, we've been here before, haven't we? It's looked a little bit different. It sounded a little bit different, but we've been here before. And companies have had these goals. They've had goals tied to compensation. Uh, Some have been able to move the needle and have reverted back. Some have moved the needle more so than others. It's how we think that is going to change the conversation, I believe. I saw a lot of questions when Cheryl was speaking about bias and unconscious bias and leaning in. I loved when she was talking about um, the concepts of um, words that are coming up in performance reviews. And it's not just performance reviews that 
typically indicate bias and things like that. To me, that's where the bulk of the work has to happen, Jessica. Um, we will have goals. Goals matter. You know, what people say, what measures is what gets done. So we will have that. I don't know if that's going to be the differentiator, believe it or not. I actually believe this sense of personal accountability, leadership within individuals is what's going to drive change. It's what's going to drive, drive change within these companies, but it's also what's going to drive change in society. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we also have a couple questions about self-directed learning. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, you know, have you received any pushback around the concept and kind of how is that going? Yeah, actually, we haven't received any pushback, but I will tell you some le leaders are leaning in more than others. And um, what we've done to try to facilitate that is to provide a DNI library. Um, Ari Emanuel, our CEO, has done um, put out some required reading for the top of the house, you know, things like white fragility and how to be an anti racist. And um, we've actually used sort of media to not just talk about things that you can read, but things that you can watch and things that you can watch with your children, things that you can um, participate in on your own quiet time. And I think that that's really, really important. Again, no pushback, but you will see the leaders that are leaning in the most are the ones that are making the most traction in terms of really open and honest dialogue within their business units. I think that uh, women and people of color, particularly black people in this latest um, movement, if you will, are being way more vocal than they have before. Some people you know, aren't as comfortable with the conversation and some people are leaning into the discomfort. And the ones that are leaning into the discomfort are the ones that are educating themselves because then it doesn't feel so foreign. Then they start to understand. Um, it, it, it's almost like you're speaking two different languages if, if individuals don't do that individual learning. Once you start doing the individual learning, it doesn't feel like two separate conversations anymore. It's, it actually becomes a dialogue. And that's what gets me excited. Great. If a few of our attendees are asking for a list of reading from your library, so maybe we could share that afterwards because yeah, uh, it's for a lot of people. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, how do you balance gaining the trust of employees while protecting the interest of the organization and its leaders, especially during these sensitive situations? I think it is a phenomenal question. It is a delicate balance. And from an HR perspective, the way you have to do it is you cannot lead with policy. You cannot lead with, for all the lawyers um, who are in the audience, of my apologies, but you can't necessarily lead with this sort of position of, if I have this conversation, am I sort of at legal risk? Don't get me wrong. You have to be mindful of those things because we do have a responsibility for our organizations. But no movement happens when conversations are too guarded. And when they're, um, you know, when the core of them are what the policy says, et cetera. I always tell my team, if you're ever going to mention policy, you better talk about why that policy exists. Because nobody, it's just like if you call, you know, a customer service thing, you don't want to hear someone say, unfortunately, which by the way, I think is a trigger word, um, but you don't want to hear people say, unfortunately, and then start explaining their policy doesn't allow you to return that rug, for example. You know, you want to talk about, well, why is that? And don't I sort of matter as a customer? And employees want to know that they matter as employees and that what they feel and what they're experiencing is real. And they want to have honest and open dialogue about that. So we have to lead in that way. We have to invite the conversation and not just wait for the conversation. And we do that with a lot of communication from our team and letting individuals on our um, at our company know kind of what we stand for. We have discussion forums, different things like that. So as a follow up, someone's also asking, would you prioritize action over perfection? So do you wait and take your time with a really thought out comprehensive plan? Or do you try to put something out that will just address some issues very quickly? Wow, another phenomenal question. I think you have to find the balance because um, perfection can have you paralyzed, can't it? And, um, you know, probably a lot of people who are participating in this conference are perfectionists. <laughs> um, it's, you know, part of high achiever syndrome, I think. But um, I think part of this is learning as we go. There is no perfect roadmap for where we are at this moment in time. 
there is no perfect blueprint. The blueprint has to be created for your particular company, recognizing where you are on your journey and using that as the starting point, not what some other company is doing as the starting point. That will not feel natural. That will not be natural. That will not be authentic. You've got to recognize where your company is and move from there. And that's why, while I'd love to be able to say what our goals are, we're still forming them because we want to make sure that we get it right, not perfect, but right. Right, exactly. Um, you know, as you're figuring out going back to work, I mean, obviously, some people may be working remotely uh, for some time. And there was a question earlier about your feelings on location based salaries. You know, there's been pushback against it. It can be viewed as discriminatory. Interested in how you're thinking about that. Sure. When we look at salaries, and this isn't just from an Endeavor perspective, but I think from an HR perspective in general, you have to look at what your market is, first of all, your market for recruiting talent. And your market, usually salaries are, are based upon a market, which can be largely driven by where that person is located. But a lot of times what's factored in is the market from where you recruit. So for a lot of professional positions, for example, um, you know, a position may be located in New York, but I may be recruiting someone from California. And so the market I'm looking at is the U.S. in that particular instance. So it's a little bit of a hybrid. I think um, I strongly suggest and I think companies do find, you know, the proper um, third party to work with on this. It will keep you honest. It will ensure that you have industry uh, relevant data by which you can compare what you're doing. And that's how you sort of set the table. I would also encourage people, this isn't over yet. And what I, I don't mean COVID, but I mean, you know, a lot of people are going directly from, okay, we used to recruit people to work in this particular city. Now we can recruit people all over. Yes, but. You know, the story hasn't ended yet in terms of how this is going to going to look. So, you know, I don't I don't see any kind of immediate go changing people's salary for the city in which they're working. We've got to continue to look at the recruitment marketplace. We've got to continue to look at how this thing is going to unfold. And, you know, cost of living. It's a tricky thing. You know, I think you and I were talking at one point about cost of living is usually only discussed when someone moves from a. Uh, lower cost of living market to a higher one. Very rarely does an employee bring it up when they're moving from a higher cost of living area to a lower one, right? So that's why, again, why the you have to look at a broad marketplace in terms of setting salaries. Got it. Got it. Great. Well, that was great. I have to collect a library of books and podcasts from you, apparently, and I will come back to our attendees with that. But thank you so much, Carrie. It was great chatting with you.